Now, this, this world was ruled by titans a long time ago, by the Siemenses and the IBMs, uh, large companies with large R&D departments, and this is exactly how they stayed in the innovation chain, innovating within their, their own company, their own R&D departments, but ch times changed. We're accelerating innovation, we're accelerating everything which relates to product development, service development, needs of the consumers, and suddenly these titans figured out that maybe the R&D departments they were running were too big, too slow, and too bulky. So what we have seen over the last years is that those R&D departments were actually rammed down. And I was part of one of those R&D departments. And they were rammed down to a point that they became actually almost invisible. They were just kept for the only sake of actually being able to be listed on the New York or other stock exchanges, because these exchanges require some of the return of investment or the revenues to be reinvestment in R&D. But in terms of really meaningful impact on the product line of the companies, very few R&D departments in this world today have a direct impact. And you figure that out is because these people do not report to the COO. And that's the one who's actually really running the show. So how does the world innovate? Well, you know, there are smaller players now coming out, smaller co companies um, essentially coming up with new ideas, with, uh, you know, new, new product development. They can do it much quicker. They're much more dynamic because they can pull in talent, which has actually been made for doing certain products. They do not need to retrain people, which have been doing other things before. And uh, we see companies like Google emerging. They themselves became a giant in their field. Things got even more atomized lately. So the development now happens not anymore with 100, uh, 200, 3,000 people. It just happens nowadays with 20 people. Look at WhatsApp. Look at Instagram. And the trend is continuing. We have a kind of an Uber economy coming, where essentially you will be your own entrepreneur running your own microeconomy, and uh, that is what Uber essentially is capitalizing on. So we, we have seen this real paradigm shift from essentially titans in our field to small entities to even small entities. Finally, it is maybe up to you as a consumer, as a citizen, to run business in this world. Now. Which type of, sorry, which type of ecosystems do we see that happening today? Clearly the computing world, that's one which comes to your world, in, uh, into mind, internet, etc. But they're not the only ones. We do have also the financial sector breaking up. We have the bio sector breaking up, the data sector breaking up. There's loads of industries, verticals, which have been titans on their own, are becoming smaller and more agile. You see, Incubator spaces for data, incubator spaces for biotech, incubator uh, space for financial stuff, internet, etc. Have you heard ever of an incubator space for telecoms? Right, so that might be just the right problem, right? So I'm sure there are small companies actually innovating in this space, but for every telecom startup and SME, you have 10 biotechs, 100 fintechs, and 1,000 internet companies. So the innovation cycle there is just so much more agile and so much more active. And this is how an SME or a startup sees essentially the cellular world, right? So just imagine yourself um, out of your job where you are right now, you have a great idea how you want to innovate in the telecom space, that's what you see. Um, a big iceberg. It looks beautiful, but it's very bulky. It is not mobile at all, whilst it is actually embedded in a very fluid and dynamic environment. Uh, to do anything here is just totally hopeless. Okay, so that's the situation today. And I'd say that's a, that's a real problem, and it's not getting better. You guys, to get from 2G to 3G, took you 10 years, even though technology maybe was quicker, but still took you 10 years. 3G, 2G, 3G to 4G, again, it took you 10 years, a little bit less. Um, 4G to 5G, unless something really dramatic happens, you will be working on the very same cycles, okay? So we're talking about maybe 10 years again, if you ask me, okay? So we have here uh, an innovation space which is servicing 
10% of the world's GDP, $8 trillion, okay, is being serviced by the wireless edge, and uh, it's not innovating at all. So we have 10-year cycles. Now, why is that happening? That's happening because everybody in this room has to agree. The Telefonicas, the Vodafones, the EEs, so all the operators and service uh, providers, manufacturers on the whole chain, software product development, you just name it all. It's a very bulky, big system here. Now, you don't see Cisco meeting Microsoft, meeting Facebook to come up with the next generation internet, do you? You don't. And that's why they, on their own, are just accelerating in development so much quicker than the telecom type of space develops, which is the reason why we are currently have download rates of megabits per second rather than terabits per second. Okay, so the big question here is uh, how much did that actually impact the whole evolution? I think it had an enormous impact on how we have started to develop or uh, starting to use the, the, the wireless technology. Uh, first of all, and most, in, most importantly, we've been discussing that, uh, business models. There has been no innovation about in and around the telco business model. It is the same you know, as we had at the beginning of this millennium as it is of 2014, okay? We have thought leaders saying that we could do this and that, loads of power pointing going on, but there's very little reality. I as a company, so I run a company besides a machine-to-machine -machine company. Uh, we currently have the, the world's largest M2M rollout in smart cities. I went to the operators, uh, asked for a data plan which would suit my needs, and we couldn't agree. Okay, and I told them, hey, why don't you shift your business model from being a data pipe to actually work on the data content, a true service provider to me as a company, but not in terms of telecom service provider, infrastructure provider, but actually a data service provider, where the real value is. I said, give me the data pipe for free. Anyway, my census would go on with a duty cycle of 0.01%, nobody would even notice. Give me the data plan for free, and I'll give you the data. And you do the same with my peers, with my competitors. You start aggregating data. You put them in your horizontal platforms, of which you have so many and so powerful. And finally, you have some data to actually crunch on and make some money out of this. It never happened. Because maybe Mike Short has the vision to do it. Maybe Luke has the vision to do it. But it doesn't trickle down to the sales force who's actually negotiating the contracts with me. So that was a real problem, 2010. Not invented, a real thing. So, and that holds to anything happening in this space currently. Okay, so that's number one. The, the other problem, though, for the operators, I think the real problem is, is there's no differentiation, really. There's no difference, you know, except that maybe what type of handset you offer, so it becomes a handset business, or what type of base station you've rolled out and what type of areas, so it becomes a, a base station infrastructure business. It's not a telecom business per se, right? So this is what it is not today. Not to talk about the technical difficulties. We have heard some brilliant visions about actually what we would love to do in the future. Industry-driven networks, tactile internet, etc. The delay, the delay, ladies and gentlemen, is a real problem on how this system is built right now. I'm not sure you understand what's actually happening. Your mobile phone in 3GPP language called UE, the user equipment, is talking to an e B. The e B is talking to the serving gateway. The serving gateway is talking to the packet gateway, and then the packet only goes out of the operator's core network. Now, what very few of you know is that actually operators do not have so many serving and packet gateways. They're not distributed all over the country. The gentlemen who are here in this room, their companies for the 4G network have maybe a handful, if they're lucky. And most of them are in the dense areas down here in the southern part of England. So imagine the scenario, my company, we're doing instrumentation for oil and gas. So I'm, I'm providing World Sensing is providing a, a temperature sensor for a refinery in Scotland. I'm running on a Telefonica O2 data plan. Um, and just beside 20 centimeters is a valve, an ABB valve, which runs on a Vodafone data plan. Now, for something, for the refinery not to blow up, they have to react very, very quickly. Okay, we're talking about milliseconds here. It's not nanoseconds, but milliseconds. So my world sensing sensor says there's a problem. Instead of being able to talk directly to that, uh, the valve, I have to go down to London, back out, up again, the whole network until I'm back in Scotland to just tell the actuator to do what it's supposed to do. Now you do speed of light, you just do the calculus, refineries have essentially blown up. 
Okay, so there's a problem, and D2D doesn't solve it today, because as uh, D2D is being designed right now, this is an interoperator uh, business, so I need to be in an orange data plan with an, uh, on both actuator and sensor for this to happen. If I'm on two different operators, we do have the very same problem, okay? So there's a very, very uh, strong structural problem here, which essentially, you figure this out very quickly when you try to get rid of this delay, relates to the core network. So the big question is, hey, can we get rid of the core in one way or another? Could we do that? So the manufacturers clearly say no because that's their bread and butter. The operators say no, and they say no for three reasons. First reason is, is because they say we need the core because we do billing and authentication with that. Fair enough. They say we do need the core because we handle mobility. Fair enough. We need the core because we offer quality of service, right? So we have three reasons, three major reasons we have the core today. The big question of 2014 I'm posing to this crowd is, could we do without the core, right? Could we do these three core functionalities without needing actually this really bulky type of infrastructure which is clearly not scalable at all, holding back if, if uh, among uh, the most important things, the business of the operators, could we do without it? The answer is we can. So just the billing and authentication, which 3GB is really brilliant on, we can virtualize it, right? So there's no reason to have that within the core. We can have the uh, mobility control very much driven to the edge. Uh, the mobile terminals today have a capability which is often matched to the one of the base station. So a lot of the stuff, you know, which we led the base station to could be done by the mobile terminal. And Alcatel Lucent has recently demonstrated that where they had essentially a really intelligent pre-buffering of multimedia content where the mobile phone knew where it is, where it is going, it knew exactly what the traffic map was, it knew there's a, there's a not spot coming, it would pre-buffer quickly more content of the video so you wouldn't even experience that. So suddenly a lot of the stuff, the intelligence which normally you would handle in the, in the core was handled by the mobile terminal. We can push basically all functionality there. Now quality of service, that's an interesting question. So I just led you with that very simple observation or with your own experience, right? So most of you may be on London, so I'm in central London. Um, for me, it is dramatic to make a phone call. It is really dramatic, okay? I have big difficulties not to get a blocked call, uh, not to get an outage. So far to quality of service. Now, to hold a Skype call with video end to end for an hour, is no problem at all, even to establish that. Okay, the outage is not perfect, but we're really talking here about systems, you know, which have been designed so differently and still the one which is flat, scalable, open, performs so much better than the one which has been engineered by trillions of engineering hours, uh, but hence uh, actually works as in a very centralized fashion, right? So there are problems here. The financial business model problems, and the actual operational problems are very serious, and if we don't change the way how we design the 5, 5G system, you will not be able to handle a delay. There's no way. So what do we want to do? Where would we love to be? Well, we would love to be here, right? A Pandora. Something, a world where you don't need to actually own the whole globe. You want to have access from all sides. Something broken up into something smaller pieces. Something very easy to handle, even as a small startup, as, a, as an innovative company, you don't want to be a Huawei in the future to be able to innovate in this space. You know, you want to be a small company which drives innovation on a very local scale. Is that already happening today? Uh, surprisingly, yes. So there's a lot of stuff happening in 3GPP which is indicating we're going this way. Luke has alluded to that a little bit, but let me give that in a historic perspective. So the first one who started to break up the whole thing were femtocells. There's a lot of resistance from various parties on femtocells, but uh, it was not the unplanned rollout which was a revolution here. It was the local IP injection which was a revolution. So as an, uh, if you own a femtocell, you can actually inject. Uh, the IP traffic without going through the whole bulky uh, core network uh, or the packet gateway, which I think was the first step to really break up the core network. We continued. So we now talk a lot about software-defined networking. That in itself, even in the internet, is a total liberalization. Um, the internet itself, actually, even though it's flat in the way how we run it, it's hierarchical how it's actually been routed, but you know, as it's perceived as a very flat structure, um, has not been very innovative inside itself either because it was essentially a very 
bulky standardized way, what Cisco and ITF said is what it, there was. Now with the SDN, meaning decoupling data and control uh, planes, we're able to introduce for the first time in human history competition into the actual internet, okay? Because we will have competitive proposals on who routes data packets better on a per flow basis from A to B. Before that was a very myopic way of doing it. It was a very standardized way how essentially the ITF has done it. Suddenly we have actually a way of really doing innovative stuff here. So a small company can come up with a really good algorithm uh, and just propose that as an innovative <coughs> proposal on the whole, whole space. And SDN is drifting slowly into the core network. So we will see that ability there as well. So suddenly we'll be able to see essentially innovation in comp competition in terms of how data is actually being transmitted within the core. There's more happening. I'm sure you follow the conversation around Newell. So Newell was acquired uh, recently for $25 uh, million, I believe, uh, by Huawei. It doesn't really matter by whom, but the story goes that uh, 3GBP realized, and um, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say this, so the uh, one operator here in this room realized that if we continue with these design cycles, by the time we have standardized machine-to-machine, -machine, MTC, in 3GBP language, the whole train will be gone, right? So the whole industrial internet will run on totally different systems, and there's a lot of competition out there. So why don't we fast-track technology within 3GBP? So we'll not go for the whole bulky thingy. We will just uh, locally at the edges inject the IP traffic and have essentially maybe base station co-sitting co co on the same space or maybe even integrated and have essentially the traffic being injected at the edge. It's a bit like the Femto, but that's a, that's a totally new thing because we are injecting an alien technology into something which was very guarded. So we had in July in 3GBP a standoff between giants in the field. I don't want to go into details. Uh, the person who's in the room knows that is welcome to stand up after I've finished and explain that in more details. But this is happening, right? So we see essentially change of culture and that is very welcoming. So there's a lot of stuff, and we would love to see more, right? So we would love to see more. We'd love, essentially, maybe a stronger deregulation even, <coughs> a stronger breakup, essentially, of what's happening there. I also believe that the design will be driven by very specific applications. And uh, uh, Luke has mentioned, essentially, a beautiful one, which is a tactile internet. And we believe in that. Tactile internet is a beautiful artifact of uh, designing essentially the next generation internet. So I personally have been behind this now for more than a year. I didn't call it the tactile internet. I called it closing the data cycle. Now I'll explain this to you in a moment until Gerhard Fettweiss from Dresden came up with this beautiful marketing term, tactile internet. And uh, this is what it is. It's a new internet we're designing here. We have three internets today. We have the fixed internet, we have the mobile internet, we have the internet of things. They have one thing in common, they're information delivery networks. What we're building here, the tactile internet, is a skill set delivery network. You're not transmitting audio, you're not transmitting video, you're transmitting your skill set. Imagine you could do remote surgery, something we explore now in King's. King's College is the UK uh, lead on the Ebola response. Wouldn't it be great with a shortage of doctors there to actually leverage on the best uh, doctor skill in every single time zones, whether that is London, uh, New York, Moscow, Singapore, and actually try to figure out what's wrong in the field there. Servicing, so this idea actually was born, I had the idea first time when I talked a year ago to a, uh, a billionaire in Asia, he told me, Misha, I have a real problem here because there are loads of planes flying around now, executive planes flying around in Asia, and for them to be serviced, we need to fly them to Dallas. Is there anything you can do about this without me building actually a servicing station in Asia? And this is when I thought about combining for the first time that skill set, telecom, remote, tactile, servicing, and I told them we could do it, but it would take time. So there's loads of application. Think of teaching. You could teach people. Uh, in, the, in, in Gaza, imagine you could teach kids to draw, to paint, to actually play the piano. So exporting the skill set is really, really important. And it's very important for a country like the United Kingdom because you are a, a skill set driven society. Wouldn't it be great to export whatever you can do with your tact to somebody else on this planet? So we believe there's a, there's a great opportunity here. So last week I inaugurated King's in a very close to, uh, academic round, the Tactile Internet Lab UK at King's College, which involves three centers, Center for Telecom Research, which is us, 
uh, we have a very strong center for robotics, and we have some very, very strong big data and artificial intelligence groups. And that's where it comes together. So on the telecom side, we will leverage our knowledge generated within the 5G IC, because a lot of the problems will be connectivity low delay problems. We will actually beef it up, specialize it specifically onto the problems which robotics has, our tactile robotics, uh, beef in some big data and essentially some artificial intelligence, which you really need at the, at the edges. It's the only way to deal with the one millisecond delay requirements and come up with this really compelling proposition for very specific verticals, starting with health. This is where we want to try that. And uh, we hope that very soon we'll have our first tactile internet system up and running. And with that, I thank you. As you like. Guy, <laughs> don't worry, you're still going to be around, I think, for the future. In your scenario, we're talking machine to machine IoT, and we talk about networks of ITs. Do you think that's really a viable? Why don't we just put the processing at the edge and, and the intelligence at the edge, and, and you, do we need a network anymore? The, the connectivity network for the sensors? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Why? Why can't you have intelligence embedded in, in the sensor itself that, so, that make a decision based? You talk about the oil and gas industry. Latency, whether it's in a, a mobile network or whether it's in a fixed IP network, will always have latency unless 5G cracks the laws of physics. Um, so are, are you saying that your sensor really should have its own intelligence, its own decision making? at that point of origin rather than in the network? So the, the problem with all the applications I have in mind, and, and I might be biased here and very limited, the, uh, the, the sensing point is different from the actuation point. Okay, and it has to happen very quickly. In fact, in all of them I can think of. So it's not the same thing, uh, not the same, same actual location. So therefore you need some form of network between both. Um, peer to peer, so I have my reservations about D2D in general because we have been trying to do wireless peer to peer for a very long time and it never worked out and even now with the ability to do it, if you want to send a picture to even to your neighbor, you would use a centralized infrastructure. So I think to have to use the, the operator's infrastructure to do that job, I think it's very compelling. And I can tell you, know, we, we initially run our IT stuff on, on Zigbee, which is low power, so you need to do multi-hop and I had to hire two or three people just to handle the, the coverage. And it's a very tricky business, you know, to, to, to actually operate a wireless network is really, really tricky. So if we have a system there which is running already for 30 years um, with people really knowing their, 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 their business, it's a very compelling story. The question to you is now is whether you have a, a, a compelling business behind this. And I give you the example of Teliasonera. Uh, so Teliasonera in Sweden has the same amount of SIM cards uh, for people as well as for machines. Okay? So not so many people, and there turns out to be a lot of instrumentation because of IEBB, et cetera. Um, what they do essentially in one year of business with the machines is what they do in two hours with the people. So the big question is, you know, is that the right model to go? If I were the CEO, I would say, you know, why would I bother even sending a single engineer, a single person into the M2M space if the money, the, the clear money is with the people? So it's a, and I think, you know, one of the operators in this room here realized that and said, hey, we need to completely revolutionize the way how we handle that. And I think you will need to change as a community the whole business model. And uh, you need to be more agile here. And a company like Nest has done it. Nest bought by Google. So Google did it, right? So Google was a strong B2C company. They acquired Nest. Nest was a pure B2C uh, sales point. So $250, you have it. Now they offer it for free. Okay, so every single Irish household will get a nest for free. So I'll let you work out what their business model is, but you know, you may want to wonder whether you could actually completely disrupt the whole space by just thinking on how you could use, you know, the, the data you're actually leveraging on completely differently. Otherwise, it's business as usual, I'm afraid. It's big business, but business as usual. Yeah. Thanks, Misha. Um, I struck by, by the difference from, in a way, from this morning and, and your talk this afternoon that 
Um, you, you made the point, which I agree with, that a lot of innovation occurs in SMEs, and you know, Nest was an SME and others. The, that the, the larger standards bodies tend to work rather slowly. That's definitely something I've observed. The more successful a standards body is, the more benefit there is in, in disrupting it or, or otherwise slowing it down from a number of players, and so the slower it tends to get. Uh, and the need for new business models, which again, I, I, I agree with. And yet, at the moment, we've got a 5G setup, which is being driven by big companies through 3GPP. Um, so if you, if you take those two worlds, it looks like they're not gonna converge. They're gonna diverge until something happens in a SME in innovation world that, that effectively catches out the, the 3GPP world and mm -hmm. uh, things go in a different direction. It mm -hmm. becomes led by the IT space rather mm -hmm. than telecom space. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's how it may play out? Or yeah. do, are, you more, yeah. are, you, are you more optimistic for convergence No, I think that? actually we're going for a big, uh, how, how you call it? Uh, Bust up. <laughs> yeah, I, I had even a more dramatic word in, in mind. So uh, business as usual is not bad, right? So we have, you know, everybody struggles. We, we know it will not be a hugely innovative space. We will maybe double or tenfold, a hundredfold, thousandfold our rates. It's okay, right? So, but if you really want to scale, we need to actually literally to disrupt it. And people in this room have recognized this. I know this, the company in this room have. But so the question is, what's the leverage now? Can they excite their peers? to get this critical mass to essentially maybe um, even break out a 3GBP3, whatever, you know, I'm giving, uh, just thinking out of the box, to allow specifically for these, uh, you know, the, explore at least the, <coughs> the breakup and see how would, that, how, how would that actually play out economically, you know? So we'll, we'll see. Mm. And, and you're right, I mean, for, you know, the comment on Wi-Fi, I think, was spot on. You know, the cellular community talks about millimeter wave, Ladies and gentlemen, dot eleven AD. We, you can buy the chips today, right? So what's what's there in twenty twenty five? The, the uh, millimeter wave chips are out there, offering you almost a gigabit per second uh, data rate. So if if the three GB would be a little bit more savvy, and allow essentially IEEE technology to be essentially very easily embedded into the three GBP billing structure and authentication structure, that would scale like uh, you know like crazy. And I think that would be for me the low hanging fruit to do that.